Good evening, my name is Harry Helling and I am the Executive Director of the Birch Aquarium at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, UC San Diego. Welcome to the Jeffrey B. Graham Perspectives on Ocean Science webinar series. This year we are organizing these webinars as themed mini-series highlighting the world-class research at Scripps. Tonight we present the last talk in a three-part series focusing on climate change impacts in California and the West. It is my great pleasure to introduce our final speaker in this series, Dr. Nina Oakley. Nina is a meteorologist at the Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes, also known as CW3E, here at Scripps Oceanography, and works on the California Department of Water Resources Atmospheric River Program. Nina received her master's and PhD degrees in atmospheric sciences from the University of Nevada, Reno. While working on her PhD, Nina also worked as a climatologist with the Western Regional Climate Center at the Desert Research Institute in Nevada. In this position, she supported a wide range of climate data users in locating, accessing, and using climate data. She also was involved in building a web-based climate tools and uh, communicating climate information to a broad audience. Nina's research interests and her work for CW3E are focused on understanding the characteristics of extreme precipitation in California and its applications to post-fire debris flows, shallow landslides, and water resources. As program manager, Nina is applying her expertise to understanding and forecasting short duration, high intensity precipitation, such as the conditions that caused the destructive January 2018 post-fire debris flow in Montecito, California. She is also participating in the development of observational systems to monitor precipitation extremes, flooding, and water resources in California. It is my great pleasure to welcome Nina this evening for her talk titled, Fire, Extreme Rainfall and Debris Flows, Cascading Disasters in a Changing Climate. Thank you, Harry, for that introduction, and thank you all for tuning in this evening. So I'll uh, start off with a little story. I grew up in, in Southern California in Santa Barbara County, and um, when I was a teenager and starting to become interested in science, uh, we had several very extreme storm events in uh, the late 90s and in early 2000s. You might remember 1994, 1995 winter, 1997, 1998, uh, some intense, uh, intense rainfall events, flooding and lots of impacts uh, for Southern California. And my mother had in, in the cabinet the, the Morton salt shaker with the phrase, when it rains, it pours. And so going through these extreme storm events, I thought, oh, yeah, when, when we have rain, it rains really intensely in, in Southern California. And, you know, I found out later that this actually refers to that the salt will still pour um, when it's humid out or raining out. Uh, there's also a song, a song about it uh, that some of you may be familiar with. Uh, it never rains in Southern California, but don't they warn you, it pours, man, it pours. And that also is probably not actually referring to the rainfall, but both are really good descriptors of what we see in uh, with rainfall in Southern California, that we have very intense rainfall during our storms, and, uh, and this can produce impacts such as post-wildfire debris flows that we'll be talking about today. So... Um, as you all heard in the introduction, my name is Nina Oakley. I am a meteorologist and climatologist with the Center for Weather, Western Weather and Water Extremes. Uh, my research focuses on extreme rainfall and post-wildfire debris flows, and that's what we'll be um, talking about today. And this is a, a multidisciplinary hazard. So with um, when we're talking about post-fire debris flows, we're considering uh, geology, geomorphology, hydrology, ecology, fire weather, fire ecology, uh, meteorology, climatology, and uh, social science even for, for understanding uh, how we communicate these hazards to people and how they respond to that. And so I'll be really focusing in today on my experience um, of meteorology and climatology associated with this, but uh, hopefully I can address um, some of your questions on the other topics involved as well. So uh, to, to get started, I wanted to uh, give a description for those who may not be familiar of what a post-fire debris flow is. And uh, post-fire debris flows are a type of landslide that can occur after a wildfire due to water repellent soils. So when a fire moves through an area, there are um, physical and chemical changes that occur in the soil that create 
a water repellent or a hydrophobic layer that you can see in the in the upper left image and the water does not um, infiltrate into the soil uh, but rather runs off and when you have intense rainfall and it runs off it will scour uh, rock ash soil and, and other debris from the the steep channels in the mountains and this material uh, is concentrated into these steep channels and then can issue out onto the alluvial fan below and if you have uh, infrastructure or homes and communities at, at the bottom of these uh, steep narrow canyons they can be impacted by debris flows and uh, so what does it take to trigger these in terms of rainfall? So uh, in Southern California, generally, very generally speaking, a quarter inch in 15 minutes can is enough to initiate a debris flow in the first year following a wildfire. Uh, in, and, and the landscape is most susceptible to the post-fire debris flows in that first year. Uh, and, and then in subsequent years, as vegetation and the soil start to recover, uh, there's, there's less of a hazard. And uh, you all may not be familiar with, well, what does a quarter inch in 15 minutes, does that happen all the time or is that rare? Uh, this is generally for the Southern California region, a less than two year rainfall event. So we'd expect to see um, this, this kind of rainfall intensity at least every other year. In some places uh, we expect it annually or, or multiple times a year. So not a rare rainfall event to, to get um, uh, triggering intensities for a post wildfire debris flow. And this, uh, this triggering intensity I mentioned here, this is just to initiate any type of debris flow. So they can range from being very small and minor to, to catastrophic as, um, as we saw in the January 2018 debris flows in Montecito. So, uh, and we'll talk a little bit uh, later about what does it take to produce a catastrophic debris flow. And, uh, but what to remember as we go through this presentation is that this short duration, high intensity rainfall is key. We're really focused on this, uh, this 15 minute uh, window for precipitation intensity. So I'd also like to describe how a post-fire debris flow is different from a shallow landslide, make sure we're all on the same page with the process that, that we're talking about. So in the image on the left, uh, we're looking at shallow landslides. You may have seen these, um, driving around in Southern California. This picture, I think, specifically is from Northern California. But uh, what I'd like you to note in that picture is you can see the, the actual release point uh, where the shallow landslide began. And the likelihood of these is related to antecedent rainfall, so how much rain uh, fell in the year to date, and also storm total. We tend to see these with high storm total rainfall. So we need conditions that are going to really saturate the soil um, and uh, to, to have these, these shallow landslides. So you can think just generally shallow landslides typically associated with a lot of rain and a very wet year. Uh, in contrast, on the right hand side, we're looking at the source region for a post wildfire debris flow. And this is, um, this is from looking at the uh, Montecito event. And so in this picture, um, I'm standing up on Camino Cielo, so at the crest of the San Ynez Mountains, looking downhill with Montecito and uh, Santa Barbara and the ocean in uh, kind of in the background of the image there. And you'll note here, you don't see a specific point source like you do with the shallow landslide, but rather that material has been scoured from these channels and then uh, moved, moved down the canyons here. So, uh, so you have uh, more contribution from, from various areas of the, the channels in the mountainside rather than uh, releasing from a specific point. And for the post-fire debris flows, the intensity, as we said in the previous slide, is the most important. The likelihood of having a post-fire debris flow is not related to how much rain you've had so far to date or the storm total rainfall, but is really about, about this intensity. So hopefully we can differentiate between the two, and today we're talking about the conditions on the, the right-hand side. There's a long history of destructive post-wildfire debris flows in Southern California. Uh, in the top row, these are two that took place in the San Gabriel Mountains with, with many fatalities. And prior to the, the Montecito event, our, our last uh, major fatality event was in the San Bernardino Mountains on the Old and Grand Prix burn areas on Christmas Day of 2003 with 16 fatalities in that event. 
uh, in the center, just to show an example of other places, no fatalities in this event, but in the Santa Monica Mountains, Camarillo Springs experienced a damaging debris flow in 2014. And then most recently, um, the tragedy in the post-fire debris flow in Montecito with 23 fatalities. So you might be asking, well, why is Southern California so prone to post-wildfire debris flows? So let's run through all the factors associated with this. So there are several factors that contribute to having impactful post-fire debris flows, and Southern California sees all of these factors. So uh, the first is having favorable geology for debris flows and erodible soils. These are present uh, throughout Southern California, especially in the, the transverse ranges, the east-west oriented mountain ranges of Southern California. Steep terrain is also a factor, and anyone who's gone for a hike in Southern California can attest to uh, that, that steep terrain is abundant in the area. Also important is if you have a debris flow and no one lives there and there's no infrastructure there, it's probably not going to be as impactful. And in Southern California, we have um, many communities and infrastructure that are situated in, in places susceptible to post-fire debris flows like alluvial fans. And in this image on uh, the right-hand side, is the community of uh, Rancho Mirage in the San Jacinto Mountains. And um, this community is situated at the base of an alluvial fan. So in the image, we're looking up towards the mountains and uh, that alluvial fan is, is the, the broad area spreading out from the base of, of um, one of the canyons. And these are great places for building because they're relatively low angle and, and relatively flat and give great views because you can get some elevation, but uh, they do pose a hazard for alluvial fan flooding and uh, debris flows. So we'll dig into this, uh, this topic of wildfire and burn severity a bit because uh, you all are familiar with wildfire in Southern California, but maybe less familiar with the concept of burn severity. So burn severity affects how susceptible a burn area is to debris flows. So looking at this, this image here uh, is showing examples of high, moderate, and low soil burn severity on a landscape. And post-fire debris flows are associated with moderate to high soil burn severity. And this is affected by fuels, uh, fire weather, uh, climate and topography. So the, the type of vegetation that's present or the that serves as fuel for the fire can affect the burn severity. And the, the chaparral seen throughout much of Southern California is conducive to these uh, moderate to high severity burns. And so to help evaluate debris flow hazard, uh, we create maps of soil burn severity. And these are done through the use of satellite imagery, but also uh, burned area emergency responders, like you see in the, the middle image here, going out to the burn areas and assessing uh, on the ground conditions to, to validate the satellite measurements and, and uh, get a better understanding of the conditions on the ground. And so when you create one of these maps, uh, it looks something like this. This is for the, the um, Thomas Fire in Santa Barbara and Ventura counties. Green colors show low burn severity, yellow is moderate, and red is high burn severity. And so if we look at the area in the westernmost on the left-hand side, uh, part of the region where the Montecito debris flows occur, uh, we see moderate to high burn severity in that area conducive to post-fire debris flows. So uh, we'll go on to our last factor and dig into that a little bit more, high intensity rainfall. So uh, the way we're going to learn about this is uh, through a couple quiz questions. So my first question for you um, is what California mountain range has the rain gauge that holds the state record for highest 24 hour precipitation total? You have six choices here and I've, I've also uh, labeled them on uh, the map to the right. Is it the North Coast Ranges, Santa Cruz Mountains, Sierra Nevada, San Inez Mountains, San Gabriel Mountains, or San Jacinto Mountains? And uh, hopefully you all picked E, San Gabriel Mountains. And this, uh, in, in 1943, at a location called Hoagie's Camp in uh, San Gabriel Mountains, nearly 26 inches were recorded in 
24 hours. And this may be a little bit counterintuitive if, uh, if you're familiar with California climate because Northern California on average is wetter than Southern California, sees more storms and higher annual rainfall totals. Uh, but we have some of the more extreme uh, rainfall events in, in Southern California. So back to the beginning, when it, when it rains, it pours in Southern California. So uh, adding on to this, because we're interested in not that 24 hour total, but, but really these hourly to sub hourly uh, rainfall durations for post fire debris flows. Your next question is, what area of California has the record for highest one hour rainfall? So is it Northern California, Central California, or Southern California? And this is a little bit of a trick question, so, so don't, um, don't overthink it, <laughs> but, uh, but give it a shot. We'll see how you do. All right, so the answer is uh, we don't have an official record. It's, it's really challenging to assess uh, the highest one hour rainfall record. And this is due to uh, the, the networks that we use to measure sub daily rainfall, not having all the data in one common format in one place and, uh, and having a lot of issues with quality control of the shorter duration data, ex especially uh, with the extremes. Uh, but unofficially looking um, through records that are available and, uh, and information other climatologists have out there, uh, 4.7 inches at Mount Palomar in 1992 during a, a thunderstorm event uh, from a record with the National Weather Service in San Diego. And there's also, if you look back into historical records, there is a, an account of 11 and a half inches and 80 minutes in Campo in eastern San Diego County uh, in 1891, but that also can't be verified. To give you a statewide perspective, this is a, some side work from a project that we did uh, looking at just one network of weather stations across the state over a 20 year period and, uh, and looking at the extremes uh, from those. And so the, the orange to red colors indicate more extreme rainfall. So getting closer to two inches or, or above in one hour. And then the yellow to green colors uh, represent lighter rainfall amounts as the maximum at those stations. And so what you should notice is across Southern California, uh, we see more of these orange and red triangles. And we also do see a few in, in Northern California. And, uh, and a lot of these, especially in Southeastern California, are associated with, with uh, warm season thunderstorms, uh, monsoon decaying tropical systems. Uh, but we do see some extremes in Southern California from, from the cool season. Uh, here's one in Santa Barbara County, um, nearly two inches on uh, December 12th, 2014, and also some extremes up here in Northern California as well. So moving on to talking about what we need to produce post-fire debris flows, you don't need a major storm to have destructive post-fire debris flows. And I'm going to express this to you in, in using the um, January 2018 Montecito debris flow as an example. So for this event, the two-day rainfall total was generally across, across the region, uh, two to five inches. And so this is a, a, an event, a one-year recurrence interval event, or an event we'd expect, expect to see um, at least one storm of that magnitude uh, each year, hopefully a few of them. And so, so generally, if we got a storm of that magnitude, it would be beneficial for water resources, for ecosystems, etc. Uh, and the storm associated with that Montecito debris flow was a, a weak atmospheric river storm. So it wasn't a, a major atmospheric river. It was a, a weak um, atmospheric river, moderate storm total. However, at, when we look at the 15 minute rainfall associated with that storm, it was quite extreme. So let's take a look at that. So um, starting in the image on the right hand side, this is showing two day precipitation total for the storm. And so we see that uh, two to five inches with the, the red colors being uh, up to five inches across the region. And then when we look at the figure on the left, this is showing 15 minute rainfall over the two day period um, of that storm. And so generally um, we have fairly light to moderate rainfall. And then this peak 
of 15 minute rainfall that is, uh, that is quite extreme at the time of the debris flow. So the total rainfall at this particular gauge, which is marked by the green star on the map, total rainfall was uh, about just over three inches. But we had this peak 15 minute intensity of about three quarters of an inch in 15 minutes. So about a quarter of the storm rainfall total over two days uh, fell in only 15 minutes. And across the, the region, when we looked into various gauges and the intensities they experienced, 15, the 15 minute rainfall was about a 50 to 200 plus year event. And it was also three to four times um, that USGS threshold for, uh, for initiating debris flows. Remember the quarter inch in 15 minutes? So now we're getting three quarter inch here at this gauge in 15 minutes. So very extreme at the 15 minute not extreme at over that two-day rainfall total, so not a major storm. The take-home point here is post-fire debris flows can occur in otherwise minor or beneficial storms if they have this high intensity rainfall. So also in a major storm, you can get a post-fire debris flow provided you have the high intensity rainfall, but you can have high storm totals without the intensities and not produce post-fire debris flows. So this, this intense rainfall is is uh, very important to consider when, uh, when with concerns of debris flow hazards. So let's take a look at what one of these bands of high intensity rainfall that produces this extreme 15 minute looks like. So um, to orient you, we're looking at, um, at Santa Barbara Ventura County here with Los Angeles um, in the lower right. And uh, this is the Thomas Fire burn area outlined in red. The area and the western part of the burn area is where we saw the uh, post-fire debris flows. And uh, you'll see a band, we're looking at radar imagery, reds indicate more intense rainfall. And so keep an eye on, on this, uh, these bands as they move eastward here. So I'll go ahead and play this. And you'll see this band start to move to the northeast and move over the burn area and dissipate uh, as, it, as it moves to the east there. And so that band moving across that burn area was what produced that 15 minute burst of high intensity rainfall. And these bands are not rare in Southern California. Um, we're, we've recently have been working on a study with this and we see um, generally at least a few a year. It's going to depend on how many storms move through the area. Uh, they vary in their intensity and their speed, so not everyone will produce a catastrophic debris flow, um, but these, these types of bands are associated with high intensity rainfall in the cool season in Southern California. So uh, now that we've talked about each of the factors and, uh, and how they play into post-fire debris flow, let's look at how they change in a warming climate. The geology of Southern California and the erodibility of the soils, not really going to change in our 20 to 40 year planning horizon. So we'll, we'll scratch that one. Don't need to talk about that more. Uh, steepness of the terrain, also not going to change. But let's look a little bit more into uh, changes in people and infrastructure that may be impacted. So um, talk about the wildland urban interface. So this is where um, communities meet the, the wildlands that can be susceptible to, uh, to wildfires and post-fire debris flows. So I've got a picture as an example in the lower right here. You can see the, the edge of a neighborhood here right up against uh, oak woodlands and, and some grasslands here. Um, so this is an example of wildland urban interface. And, uh, and We've seen, shown in the image on the left, a change in the wildland urban interface since 1990. And the red colors represent areas where the wildland urban interface has expanded uh, since 1990. And so in Southern California, you see quite a few examples of where this has expanded, also in the Sierra foothills and uh, in Northern California. And so this means there are more people and infrastructure that uh, can be impacted by uh, wildfires and post-fire debris flows. And uh, an expansion of the wildland urban interface can also contribute to increased wildfire risk. You have more people in the WUI doing uh, activities that give more opportunity for ignitions. It's difficult to fight fires in these areas. And also um, putting people and infrastructure into these areas can fragment vegetation habitats and uh, landscaping can introduce invasive species that can cause wildfire problems. 
So um, now let's look into how wildfire and burn severity will change in the future. So looking at, at wildfire in Southern California, um, this is a, a huge topic, and so I'm only going to, uh, to give a very high level overview on it. And it's important when talking about wildfire and climate change in Southern California to, uh, to, to, consider that it's to consider it distinct from the rest of the state and the rest of the Western US. And, and this is due to the fact that in Southern California, the, pretty much every year, the Southern California shrublands are fire prone. Uh, there's a period in which they dry out and are receptive to ignitions and starting a fire. And so this, uh, some researchers have referred to this as an ignition limited ecosystem. Every year you have a period where, um, where if you have an ignition, you can get a wildfire going. Um, so that is not likely to change in the future. However, that period of, uh, during which the fuels are receptive is, is likely to, um, to lengthen. Uh, also shifts in vegetation, so conversion from chaparral to grassland, say, can increase the fire recurrence. Grasslands dry out very quickly and, um, and grow quickly as well, so that could increase fire recurrence, but will change uh, the character of the fire. Um, if with a lengthened fire season, and we'll talk more about that on the next slide, uh, you can have more fires with a longer fire season and potentially larger fires if you intersect more with Santa Ana winds. But really in Southern California, the, the anthropogenic factors such as increasing that population and having more activity in the wildland urban interface since most fire ignitions in Southern California are, uh, are human caused are really the key factors. And there's, there remains a lot of uncertainty in predicting exactly what will happen with future wildfire activity. I've given very much given an overview and not pointed to my references. And if you're interested in digging a little deeper, I've uh, put a link to to report colleagues and I um, prepared that that will allow you to dive deeper on these. So let's talk about changes in the length of the fire season. So looking at the image on the left uh, to orient you, the pink panel in the background is showing the historic period of the fire season. And I'm saying historic because we've already started to see the shift. So the orange line is showing when we expect fuels to have max, uh, maximum flammability, be most receptive to, to ignitions. And uh, that's peaking in our main fire season. And then we see that the, the offshore wind season, the Santa Ana wind season, kind of at the, the end of that um, fire window. And, uh, and then our precipitation uh, starting to kick in in um, in the fall with the green shown by the green line and then rising through February. Now in uh, in a future climate, what we expect to see is that is a delayed onset of precipitation. So if we look at that uh, that green line, you see now it's ramping up more in in uh, November and into December, and that is extending that that fire season and broadening that, that curve of uh, flammability of the fuels and, and when they're receptive to ignitions. And now when we extend that fire season, we also move fire season into um, the, the onset of the Santa Ana winds. And so you have uh, um, not only a chance for more fires with an extended fire season, but more overlap with the Santa Ana winds, which could uh, increase the risk of, um, of large fires. Uh, as the, the winds can drive uh, large uh, rapid fire spread. And so relating this back to post-fire debris flows, not only might you have more areas to consider if you have more fires, uh, but it gives a much shorter window between the fire and the onset of rains for emergency managers and property owners, et cetera, to prepare for uh, post-fire hazards. So with burn severity, uh, we don't really have a clear trend for Southern California. So this, this image is showing uh, one measurement of burn severity, looking at a historic period, 1984 to 2012, as compared to a mid-century um, projection, 2040 to 2069. And the changes that we see here are, uh, you see in Southern California, there are a few of the pixels that show uh, becoming slightly more severe, a few of the pixels show slightly less severe, and some show no change. So 
Uh, predicting future burn severity is, is a challenging thing to do. It depends on ecological factors, land management factors, in addition to weather and climate factors. So um, so hard to say exactly which direction uh, that will go and have a clear signal on that. Um, so we're down to our last factor, high intensity rainfall. How will this change in warming climate? So in Southern California, as you probably knew or expected, uh, rainfall is projected to intensify in a warming climate. And we don't see a clear trend in, um, in Southern California getting wetter or drier, um, possibly staying about the same. But what climate models do show, um, even though we don't see a change in, in precipitation totals, on average, uh, what we do see is an increase in the number of dry days. So if we, uh, if we have about the same amount of, of rainfall, but we increase the number of dry days, that means we have more intense precipitation on the days that it, that it does rain. And this is, uh, this is associated with what we call the clausius clapeyron relation, which uh, describes how as temperature increases, an air mass can contain more water vapor. And this, this rate of increase is about, um, for one degree Fahrenheit increase, about 4% more water vapor that can be contained in the atmosphere. And so when you have more water vapor in the atmosphere, there's more uh, water vapor available to, uh, to fall out as rain. So this is uh, thinking about things from the storm total or, or daily total or annual total perspective, but uh, it's a little bit different when we go down to that sub-daily rainfall that we're interested in for post-fire debris flows. I'm presenting you with a very complicated schematic on the right, so don't, don't worry too much about interpreting that. The point is that it's complicated. That is what I'm trying to show here. And, and if you, you'd really like to stare at it and dig in and understand it, I've got the reference for you. Um, Haley Feller and colleagues did a nice uh, review of literature on um, sub-daily rainfall intensification. So when we're talking about sub-daily rainfall like that, that may drive uh, post-fire debris flows, um, we uh, research has found that it may intensify more than the clausius clapeyron relation suggests. And this is due to, uh, to atmosphere, atmospheric and cloud processes and there's quite a few factors to consider in this. And uh, most of the research to date has been done on, on warm season processes. So think major thunderstorms. We have less work on, on uh, cool season processes that are similar to what we're concerned about for post-fire debris flows in California. And there are some re emerging results that, that consider uh, California, but they don't exactly focus on Southern California and on the type of storms that, that we're interested in particular. So we do need more research to understand uh, how sub-daily rainfall is intensifying in, uh, in the California cool season. So I wanna go back to, to, before we wrap up, some of the, the main principles and talk about earlier in the talk and check your understanding. So true or false, it is very, it is very unlikely that post-fire debris flows or flash floods on recent burn scars will occur in a drought year. So true or false? I'll give you a moment to consider. Hopefully you all know the answer quickly and effectively here. So the answer is false. All it takes is one high intensity event. So even if we only get one storm for the season, if it has high intensity rainfall and it impacts a burn scar, you can get a post-fire debris flow. And in fact, during the Montecito debris flow, there was moderate drought shown by this, this tan color uh, in, in the impacted areas. So yes, you can have, we can have flash flooding, and in, in, even not on burn scars, uh, but flash flooding and debris flows can most definitely happen uh, in, in a drought year. So got to stay focused. All right, uh, another quiz question. You have a recent fire with high burn severity in steep terrain with homes on the alluvial fan below. Which best describes what you need to trigger a post-fire debris flow in this area? So take a moment to pick your answer. And hopefully you all chose B, that 15 minute burst of high intensity rainfall. So with C, if your major storm lasting several days had high intensity rainfall in it, yes, um, you could trigger a debris flow. Or in your very wet winter season, if you had some high intensity rainfall, could trigger a debris flow. But 
best description, best answer here is, is B. All right, so we've talked about that we have a post-fired reflow issue in Southern California. And uh, so what can we what can we do about it? What are some tools we can use or things to consider? So um, what I'm presenting to you here is very, very recent work from uh, from two researchers at USGS that tries to assess. Um, so we know we have a very short response time, especially in a changing climate, to prepare for post fire debris flows. So can we identify the most susceptible areas and and then uh, use that? identification as a way to plan for uh, mitigating post-fire debris flow hazards. And so, uh, so they're considering several of the factors we talked about. Um, the terrain uh, generally slopes over 23 degrees are, are uh, the most susceptible. Um, terrain, geology, and soils. Um, fire frequency, they're using historic fire frequency, and they're using median historic uh, burn severity in this graphic I'm showing you. And this is looking at the probability of major debris flows. And so they're defining major debris flows as, uh, as debris flows capable of um, damaging 40 or more structures. And so for that, they're using rainfall three times over that 15 minute threshold. So at least, um, so thresholds are gonna vary slightly across Southern California, but we're looking at rainfall three times over the, the triggering threshold. So in the most susceptible areas, um, in the San Gabriel and uh, parts of the San Inez into the Topa Topa San Rafael here, there's about a two to 4% chance of major debris flows in, in any given year in these most susceptible areas. And then region-wide, the researchers found that about every 10 to 13 years, there's uh, you're likely to have a major debris flow somewhere in Southern California. And that's considering uh, the, the past stationary climate. So. If we just consider a 4.5 degree Fahrenheit change uh, following the RCP 4.5, and considering that clausius clapeyron relation, approximately 4% per um, degree Fahrenheit, uh, we end up with approximately an 18% increase in rainfall intensity. And that's what the researchers applied here. They found debris flow probability was most sensitive to rainfall intensification. And so you, um, you can note that the the area of these the most susceptible areas uh, expands. You see more more reds and yellows in the map on the right. Uh, they found that just by increasing the rainfall intensity by eighteen percent, uh, you you about double your probability of major debris flows in the area. So now you'd be expecting them on the order of every five years rather than every ten years. So um, considering this, and if you identify hazard, hazardous places, what can be done? Um, you may have seen going around Southern California debris basins, uh, debris fences uh, can be put up in areas to, to mitigate the hazard, as well as um, signage, education, and outreach, letting people know they're in a hazardous area. Uh, perhaps people can use their, their landscaping or uh, modify their building practices to, to account for the post-fire debris flow hazard in their area. Uh, my group in particular, as we do um, meteorology, have been working on improving forecasts of high intensity rainfall. So uh, this is an example from uh, a storm on February 2nd, 2019. On the left-hand side, we see what the radar observed. And on the right-hand side, we see a model simulation of that. And so the model reasonably simulates the characteristics of this intense rain band. Uh, but through we, uh, we run an ensemble, so, so um, uh, lots of different realizations of, of this storm with, with little tweaks to them. Uh, we we find that that the uh, model lacks detail and varies in timing and location and intensity across the ensemble members. So we're working on how do we improve um, the the forecasting of this high intensity rainfall. Uh, we also have a program called Atmospheric River Reconnaissance that we use to improve rainfall forecasts in general, uh, which, which will also influence that short duration, high intensity rainfall forecast. And uh, we have challenges with forecasting atmospheric rivers due to the lack of uh, observations over the Pacific. So in this program that uh, that's running each winter, um, we have uh, aircraft that are going out and making observations so that the map image here is showing the an atmospheric river about to impact um, the Pacific Northwest and 
we have a flight path in, in blue and in red that the aircraft will take. And they're dropping these things called drop songs out of the plane that give us a vertical profile of, of the atmosphere and give us um, uh, information. And that information is then put into forecast models and will improve uh, the forecast models. So, um, so that's one way we're, we're working on improving forecasts and, and understanding when, when and why the models don't do as well as we'd like them to. And uh, I'll leave you with some tools that you can use uh, yourself to monitor post-fire debris flow hazards, uh, following your local National Weather Service and also your, your um, emergency officials, so sheriff's office, etc., cetera, um, County Office of Emergency Services on social media. That is where you will get information about post-fire debris flow hazards in your area and just maintaining uh, awareness of weather conditions uh, if you're in a hazard area. And this is an example of an image from National Weather Service um, in uh, Monterey for the, the uh, Central California area from the late January storm where we had debris flows on, on several burn areas um, in their forecast area. Uh, on the right hand side, um, there is a tool developed by uh, USGS, a GIS based tool where you can, uh, you can see a recent burn scar and determine areas of high um, high debris flow probability within that burn scar. And if there's been a recent fire in your area and you're concerned, uh, your county office of emergency services is the best place to start um, to figure out your hazard. We, we do get uh, <laughs> questions as researchers, uh, you know, what should I do to protect my home? Yeah, contact your, your county office of emergency services for those concerns. And uh, I'll wrap it up with saying thank you and uh, stay safe. And this is a picture on our way out to Catalina as part of uh, atmospheric river reconnaissance to launch weather balloons uh, before the pandemic began. And thank you so much for tuning in. I, I hope you, um, you learned something and are more aware of post-fire debris flow hazards in Southern California. Thanks. Thank you very much, Nina. That was terrific. Really um, glad that you were able to join us and present in our series. Um, we do actually have some questions for you if you're ready for the Q&A period. Sure, go ahead. Thank you. And I, I did want to um, to uh, quickly acknowledge my, my research sponsors that have supported this work on extreme precipitation and geohazards. Uh, the National Weather Service Sea Star Program, the California Department of Water Resources Atmospheric River Program, and the U.S. Geological Survey are supporting this, this research on extreme precipitation and geohazards. Great, thank you very much. Um, we actually have uh, questions uh, about um, about that, as you might imagine. Um, one of the first questions, is there a certain threshold of acreage burn that factors into how impactful post wildfire debris flows are? That is on top of the burn, uh, the burn uh, severity factor. Yeah, so the, the larger the burn area you have is, the more, um, if you think of a mountainside, can have multiple channels in it and, and um, uh, like canyons that, that debris flows can come down. So the more of those, of those small watersheds you have, uh, the, the more opportunities for debris flows within a burn area. But even just a single watershed um, can have a debris flow and there is, uh, the contributing area does matter in how much material you can move into that channel. But um, I can't myself speak to a specific size of the channel that you need to generate a catastrophic debris flow. Um, and we have seen pretty damaging debris flows even in um, fairly small burn areas. Um, one example is in, uh, Western Santa Barbara County, the Sherpa fire was not one, it's probably a fire you never heard of. It wasn't a, a, a huge uh, fire, but um, it did um, uh, burn a steep canyon that was large enough to, uh, to produce a damaging debris flow in, um, oh, I can't remember the date. Uh, I believe that was in 2018. 2017. <laughs> so, uh, so even with a, um, yeah, even with a relatively small burn area, you still do have a, a debris flow hazard if the other factors are present. Uh, and then uh, a somewhat a related question. Um, there was one slide, the burn severity slide, and they asked, what does unburnable mean? Yeah, so unburnable would be urban areas. So um, that's going to be um, 
you know, homes, I guess, technically are, are burnable, but uh, it's going to be uh, urban areas that, that uh, are not readily burned. This is a slightly uh, different type of question. Um, it's regarding um, the sensor data that you use in your assessments and, and what type it is. Is it radar, infrared, LIDAR? What, what kinds of sensors are you using to do your assessments? Right. So I guess there's a, this would be which, which part of the, as I mentioned in the beginning, this is a, a really um, multidisciplinary problem um, with lots of scientists from, from lots of different um, fields working on it. And so, um, so uh, as a meteorologist, I'm not uh, generally out there, you know, measuring the, the debris flow itself, but um, my colleagues with, um, with the US Geological Survey, California Geological Survey and at various universities, uh, when they are trying to measure debris flows, um, what they often put out is a, a laser stage gauge. So it's a laser that'll, that'll point over the, um, uh, in, um, across the channel and sense movement of a debris flow down uh, down a slope and and they'll have that paired with a rain gauge and so it's really important to get the exact timing of a debris flow and be able to relate it to uh, to the uh, the precipitation information the rainfall data because we want to know not just what was the peak intensity of the storm but what rainfall intensity did it take to trigger the debris flow and so lots of these observations have been made in southern california uh, with the exact um, timing of debris flow uh, combined with rainfall um, you can also use a pressure transducer put into the channel that will measure the the timing of the debris flow coming by but having these exact timings is is really critical to to develop a database of debris flow triggering thresholds. Uh, and then as far as what we do from, uh, from the meteorology side, uh, we're using rain gauges a lot to look uh, to understand storm characteristics and uh, weather radar data and um, atmospheric reanalysis data sets that are built from, from a variety of, of different uh, resources. So depending on what angle of the post-fire debris flow problem you're looking at, uh, you'll use a different set of, of uh, sensors. And then someone does have a question about what we could expect as a result, I assume, of climate change. Um, can we expect increase, increases in severe rainfall events for Southern California over the next 10 years? Uh, yeah, to put it to put it short, I'd say yes. <laughs> um, we we should. We're already seeing uh, some of the the impacts of climate change uh, that you know we expected a little further out um, happening now. For example, uh, the delayed onset of the rainy season was definitely. Um, uh, something and in, in the early end to it was something that we saw uh, this year. And um, and uh, so, yes, I, I think we should be um, prepared for for in, for increasing um, weather extremes in general uh, over the next decade. Here's another question. Does California have state regulations that prevent new infrastructure from being built in steep fire prone areas without mitigative fire or post-fire debris flow design features or maybe local? Are there regulations? We, I think we all saw that alluvial fan that you showed and wondered why are people allowed to build there? <laughs> Right. And, and I think, uh, you know, I, I should note, I don't know specifically about that community, but um, if in that in that image, you may have noticed that at the apex at the top of the fan, uh, there was a golf course at the top or what what appeared to be a golf course. And that may indeed be a mitigation strategy of having um, having something like a park or a golf course that is not going to uh, damage life or property if it were to be flooded. Um, sometimes, you know, that's used as a mitigation strategy or a, a debris basin. And um, so so that may be something in that particular example. Um, as far as specific regulations, and unfortunately, I don't have a great answer for you um, as, as a research scientist. Um, yeah, so I, I can't speak to, to what regulations may, may be in place. So I have a, a question um, that gets at um, something that I'm curious about, which is we're in a Mediterranean climate, and I know that that's part of what leads to our, you know, our wildfire risk. Uh, I wonder if there are other parts of the world with Mediterranean climates that have similar problems with uh, with these post-fire debris flows. Uh, 
Right. So, so you know, even in for uh, uh, in the Western U.S., we do see post-fire debris flows basically throughout the the Western U.S. in places where we have complex terrain. So these are a, a major issue in the Southwest, um, especially uh, they um, will have their fire season um, in you know June is maybe I think the max of their fire season in Arizona, New Mexico, and then uh, immediately or during that season you start to have the onset of the uh, monsoon and very intense thunderstorms associated with the the um, North American monsoon, and so they have a very short window sometimes after wildfires to. Uh, to get it and put in mitigation strategies and, and or uh, research observations. And uh, this is also an issue um, into Northern California and Pacific Northwest and even in uh, in the Great Basin. So um, we do we do see these in other places. We just see them more frequently in Southern California and uh, and we have fewer observations. And there's also they're tending to happen in other places um, with that aren't uh, in other places of the Western US that aren't as populated. And uh, and yes, we do see them in in uh, in other places with uh, steep terrain and um, and wildfire in, in uh, other parts of the world. So I think that's about it for the questions, Nina. I want to thank you again for making the time to talk to us about this really interesting phenomena, one that I think we've all, all heard about, um, but we know a tremendous amount more now. But thank you very much for um, all of the information you provided. And um, I hope to see um, all of you who have attended this uh, speaker series join us uh, starting uh, May 10th for the next uh, three-part talk series uh, when we'll be looking at climate stakeholders and how Scripps informs uh, a whole wide variety of those stakeholders with respect to climate change impacts in California and the West. I hope everyone has a lovely evening and uh, thank you everyone. Good night. <laughs>